to turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 6. I'm going to read that to you. Starting then at the, the very top. Now the ark of the Lord was in the country of the Philistines seven months. And the Philistines called for the priests and the diviners, saying, What shall we do with the ark of the Lord? Tell us how we should send it to its place. So they said, If you send away the ark of God of Israel, do not send it empty. But by all means, return it to him with a trespass offering. Then you will be healed, and it will be known to you why his hand is not removed from you. Then they said, What is the trespass offering we shall return to him? They answered, Five golden tumors and five golden rats, according to the number of the laws of the Philistines. For the same plague was on all of you and on your lords. Verse 5, Therefore you shall make images of your tumors and images of your rats that ravish the land, and you shall give glory to the God of Israel. Perhaps he will lighten his hand from you from your gods and from your land. Why then do you harden your hearts as the Egyptians and the Pharaoh hardened their hearts when he did mighty things among them? Did they not let the people go that they might depart? Now therefore make a new cart, take two milk cows which have never been yoked and hitch the cows to the cart and take their calves home away from them. Then take the ark of the Lord and set it on the cart, and put the articles of gold which you are returning to him as a trespass offering in a chest by its side. Then send it away and let it go. And watch. If it goes up to the road in its own territory to Beth Shemesh, then he has done us this great evil. But if not, then we shall know that, is not, that it is not his hand that struck us. It happened to us by chance. Then the men did so. They took two milk cows and hitched them to the cart and shut up their calves at home. And they set the ark of the Lord on the cart and the chest with the gold rats and the images of their tumors. Then the cows headed straight for the road of Beth Shemesh and went along the highway, lowing as they went, and did not turn aside to the right hand or the left. And the Lord of the Philistines went after them to the border of Beth Shemesh. Verse 13, Now the people of Beth Shemesh were reaping their wheat, harvest in the valley. And they lifted their eyes and saw the ark and rejoiced to see it. Then the cart came into the field of Joshua, of Beth Shemesh, and, and stood there. A large stone was there. So they split the wood of the cart and offered the cows as a burnt offering to the Lord. The Levites took down the ark of the Lord and the, and the chest that was with it, in which were the articles of gold, and put them on a large stone. Then the men of Beth Shemesh offered burnt offerings and made sacrifices the same day to the Lord. So when the five lords of the Philistines had seen it, they returned to Ekron the same day. These are the golden tumors which the Philistines returned as a trespass offering to the Lord. One for Ashdod, one for Gaza, one for Ashkelon, one for Gath, and one for Ekron. And the golden rats, according to the number of all the cities of the Philistines, belonging to the five lords. Both fortified cities and country villages, even as far as the large stone of Abel, and on which they set the ark of the Lord, which stone remains to this day in the field of Joshua of Beth Shemesh. Verse 19, the final verse, Then he struck the men of Beth Shemesh, because they had looked into the ark of the Lord. He struck 50,070 men of the people, and the people lamented, because the Lord had struck the people with a great slaughter. Forgive me, verse 20. And the, and the men of Beth Shemesh said, Who is able to stand before this holy Lord God? And to whom shall it go up from us? So they sent messengers to the inhabitants of Kijar Jerarim, saying, The Philistines have brought back the ark of the Lord. 
come down and take it up with you. Let us pray. Father, we indeed commit ourselves for you, to you in this short time together. We ask, I ask, no doubt those sat before me would ask that you would speak to us, help us, help me. Lord, what, does, what would you have to say to us on this eve? Help us, O oh God, by your Spirit, in the name of Jesus. Amen. So here we are again. 1 Samuel, chapter 6. I want to say to you, I've never heard anyone preach on this in my time in being in church. I was, um, well, Nick, you know Nick, he's always up for a laugh. He said, because he's, he's next week, chapter 7. He said, I had to read the context. I read chapter 6 and said, I'm glad I'm not doing that one. <laughs> it's quite the chapter, isn't it? quite the chapter and I found myself thinking how do I tackle this one how do we look into this again I know in part this is repetition and I think most of us have said it but I'll say it again within these chapters we've got to glean what we think is right for us and right for you what, what, where do we go there's probably you know we can't put a number of sermons that's in that chapter but where do we go what do we do Early on Thursday morning, I woke up thinking about golden rats and tumours and carts and cows. That was the thing that I was, well, in all honesty, sat in my study thinking of. Carts and cat, not cats, cows, not cats, tumours and rats. And also, why, why wasn't it that these men who looked into the ark... Why did they die? I don't know that it says that the why, why that happened. Just all of a sudden this kind of moment comes and then he struck the men of Bethlehem because they looked in the ark. What, what are we going to do with that this evening? We're together. How can this story, 10 centuries before Christ, be applicable to us tonight, 2,000 years on after Christ? How can that be so? Is it so? What does it mean for us today, tonight? What can we learn from a chapter like this? We've been reminded before, but let's be right, reminded again here tonight, not only for this sermon, in fact, indeed, we could follow on in part from what our brother was saying this morning, not just for this sermon, but for your own readings and for your own meditations upon the scriptures. Romans 15, 4 says, For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Saints, the, the chapter to which we look at tonight is as much inspired as Genesis 1. It is as much inspired as Ephesians 5 or Psalm 23. Though, of course, those texts are far, far, far more familiar, I no doubt, could confidently, to most of us, all of us, they're, they're far more familiar to us. Yet, as we consider this together tonight, let us with the same urgency and with the same passion look at this chapter, knowing that it was penned by the Holy Spirit for our learning, and that through this we might have hope then where do we start where do we start again with with no apology really we must and we will continue as much as we can reflect what has gone on before we've spent the last maybe three or four maybe this is the fourth um, sermon in and around the ark the ark has been very much the story in these last weeks as we tackle one Samuel together on an evening we know already, do we not, that the ark has been captured. The ark is in the possession of the Philistines after the battle to which the Philistines defeated Israel on two occasions. On one occasion, or the first occasion, losing 4,000 men. And on the second occasion, we read that over 30,000 foot soldiers were slaughtered. 
We know that the Israelites had presumed, as I spoke on some weeks ago, presumed on the very presence of the ark of this second battle. Get us the ark was the cry. Let the ark be, be amongst us. A presumption. Not actually looking to the God of the ark, but rather the ark itself. Concluding then, as Craig did some weeks back, with the reality of Ichabod. Remember the child's name was called Ichabod, meaning the glory has departed because the ark of God has been captured. We heard last week, didn't we, from Nathan with regards to chapter 5. The Philistines took the ark to the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. They're the words. This Dagon was the God of the Philistines. I was thinking more of this when Nathan was saying, uh, speaking to us last night, last night, last week. Dagon. You know, if you, if, if, if you were to turn there, I just quote it, but we see Dagon in the book of Judges. It was Dagon, listen to this, it was Dagon to whom they praised for the capture of Samson. It's interesting, isn't it? It's Dagon they praise for the capture of Samson. It says that in, in Judges 16, 23. Now the Lord of the Philistines gathered together to a, offer a great sacrifice to Dagon their God and to rejoice. And they said, our God has delivered into our hands Samson, our enemy. That puts a, another, another layer, if you like, not, not by any means does Nathan's sermon need another layer, but it puts another layer of exactly what the application was, that they thought that their God, Dagon, had delivered into their hands Samson. And we know, don't we? And that's really, let me jump ahead, where we'll conclude again this evening. That Christ crushes the head of the serpent. That he is the one who defeats his enemies. And he makes a public spectacle of them. You see, Dagon then was this one to whom the Philistines looked to and worshipped and certainly, as already noted, accredited praise to him for his, for his protection and deliverance. Yet now in chapter 5, as we were so wonderfully encouraged to note last week, we see the presence of the ark deal with Dagon. On the first morning of the ark being in the house of Dagon, the so-called God of Dagon. I, I, if you read it, if you read it, go back and read it at some other point. It's lovely how it's, how it's put that, that Dagon was fallen on its face. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God our Father. Amen. Isn't it, is it, in some sense, we make these, 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 these chapters complicated, but as we begin to, to read them through the eyes, uh, hermeneutically, properly, applying it rightly to the whole realm of Scripture, what we see is Christ is King. Second morning, Dagon's head and palms of his hands were broken off. question then, in response to all of this, was from the Philistines, what shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel? We see that in chapter 5, verse 8. We see, if you like, the, the ark passed around the Philistines like a hot potato. From Gath to Ekron and possibly other places too. Wherever the ark was, it was like the scene as we read throughout, remember, the, the, the story of the Exodus? And all the Lord did there, Nathan um, opened that up last week. We see this great scene taking place. Wherever the, the ark went, there were, in the eyes of the Philistines, trouble. Trouble had come to them. And then we find ourselves in chapter 6, of, to which we shall spend some time considering. You see, this, this chapter then opens up by telling us 
all is really that Nathan addressed with us last week all took place for seven months. Now is that there by accident? Is that there just for no reason? Maybe if I was brave enough we could just have a sermon on that. That this took place for seven months. That, that the ark was there in the country of the Philistines for seven months. All that took place in chapter 5 was not over a matter of days, but of months. It might take us days to read through Samuel, but these events took months. You see, number seven, if we were going to just linger just for, just for a moment, number seven often signifies completeness. Maybe, here then, in this verse, we see the time of the ark being with the Philistines is over. It's over. The time of seven months is now complete. I don't know what that verse makes you think as you read that opening verse there in chapter 6. The ark of the Lord was in the country of the Philistines seven months. Does that make you think? If we, if we are thinkers when we read our Bible, what does that do when we read that? Can we ask ourselves anything? What was life like for Israel within that time? What was going on in Israel then? The Ark of the Covenant was not with them. What was going on there? The very sign of God's presence and promise were not there. What was going on in this land of Israel? Again, it would probably be worth a sermon of itself. I mean, in many ways, life would have had to go on. We read in verse 13 that people were reaping their wheat, doing the things that they needed to do. They were still in harvest and still doing the things that were required. But I just, I only leave it with you for thought this evening. Were God's people mourning such? The ark was not with them. We see then in verse 2 what takes place is the same question that was asked in chapter 5. What shall we do with the ark of the Lord? They've gone to their own priests, if you like, or diviners. What shall we do with the ark of the Lord? It's the question. What are we going to do with this ark of the Lord? What we do read from verses 3 till nine, through 9, I won't read them again to you, but what we read there is instruction from these so-called priests or diviners. Again, one thing to note, or I suppose even ask of ourselves is, again, this is, this is the way I think, by the way. Why, why, why didn't the Philistines just take it away from them? Why didn't, why, didn't, why didn't they just, if you like, do it with a fly tipping? Yeah? You know what fly tipping is? God's people say they have no idea what fly tipping is. Why, why, didn't, why, why, why didn't they just get this box and just chuck it out somewhere? Is that not the most logic thing to do? Or why didn't they go to the local skip and, and find the right section where to put this thing? I think that's a fair question, don't you? It's gone from city to city. It's causing, it's causing all of this pain upon their own people, these Philistines. Why don't they just burn the thing? Why don't they put it on a bonfire? Why don't they just get rid of this ark of God? I don't care where, but not here with us might be their, their mindset. But it wasn't. You see, whatever is going on with these diviners, there was a sense within them, or a direction of them, that they needed to return this ark and return it to the Israelites with some kind of reverence. Sending the ark with a trespass offering. You see, this, this offering is intended to acknowledge guilt and maybe compensate for the taking of the ark. They know they needed to do something. 
They didn't just go and fly tip it. They didn't, they didn't just take it to the local skip and they would not have a bonfire with it. They recognized that this must go. If you go back to the very beginning of the, the chapter, and I only, I only just noted this as I'm reading it out to you. So they said, if you send away the ark of God of Israel, listen to this, do not send it empty, but by all means return it to him. Yeah. Friends, all I want to do tonight is provoke your thinking. Do we want to return it to him, the God of Israel? Sending with this ark a trespass offering. This offering is intended, as I've already said, to acknowledge something of guilt. A guilt offering, we could term it. Maybe a compensate for this. Verse 5 says, Therefore you shall make images of tumors. I don't know what they look like, but of tumors. And of images of your rats. Some translation says mice. Excuse me. <coughs> that ravish the land, and you shall give glory to the God of Israel. Perhaps he will lighten his hand from you, from your gods, and from your land. Stay with me. It's hard though, isn't it, to determine what is the heart of these Philistines, as they at least say with their mouth, seem to give glory to the God of Israel. Some, some acknowledgement there. We could then ask the question, is this further judgment on Israel? Remember, that's why it is important to reflect. It is important to bring in the context. We know why the ark is in the hands of the Philistines. We know, remember, the two priests, Hophni and Phineas. We remember them, don't we? How they had no regard for the worship of God. How they had no regard for the ark of the Lord. Here, we're reading something that actually these, the enemy of God, if you can put it like that, maybe there's a, there's a sense of reverence with them that right now in these days that was not quite with those people of Israel who were so-called God's people. The advice continues. They now make images of five golden rats and tumors. This was the trespass offering, I've already said, from the Philistines. Why rats and why tumors? Apparently, that was in their custom to make models of their sores, their sores and, and the rats, which they would see that that's where the plague would come from in the hopes that the deity would recognize that they knew why he was angry and then they would remove the evil which had befallen upon them. Again, it goes on into verse 6. Why then do you harden your hearts as the Egyptians and the Pharaoh hardened their hearts when he did mighty things among them? Did they not let the people go that they might depart? Some knowledge here, isn't there? Some reflection of what was. These diviners had compared that which is happening to them to that which took place with Egypt and the hardening to which Pharaoh and the Egyptians had. Maybe then in, the, in this camp there were those who didn't want to send the ark back. Maybe, maybe that's a question. Maybe they're saying, no, 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 we, we keep this. Maybe that, that's a reality. Then maybe there were those who understood, as we read, that the hand of the Lord was heavy upon them and to harden one heart would be both ignorant and foolish. I cannot deny that the God, this God of Israel, has brought this upon us like he brought it upon Pharaoh and his friends. There was some recognition of that. They knew their history. They looked back and said, that's what took place in Egypt. Again, Nathan opened that up to us last week. But here there is some reference to that. Why are you hardening your hearts to this? We've seen this happen before. So then we come into verse 7 and 9. 
And really it's there I want to stay. Verse 7 and 9. As again, remember, on Thursday morning, and I don't just say for effect, I woke up thinking about cows and carts, thinking there's something in that. Cows and carts. Johnny, maybe we could call this sermon Cows and Carts. Verse 7. Now therefore make a new cart. Take two milk cows which I have never been that has never been yoked, and hitch the cows to the cart, and take their calves home, away from them. Then take the ark of the Lord and set it on the cart. And put the articles of gold which you are returning to him as a trespass offering in a chest by its side. And send it away and let it go. And watch. If it goes up the road to its own territory, to Beth Shemesh, then he has done us this great evil. But if not, then we shall know that it is not his hand that struck us. It happened by chance. I think what we see here is another 1 Kings 18 kind of moment. 1 Kings 18, you'll remember, fire fell on the altar. And we knew by that that this was the God of Israel. We know that God showed himself in that moment sending fire on the water-soaked altar. Remember the story? I think that's what we have here. You see, the Philistines here choose us for the transportation of this ark, a new cart, and two milk cows. It almost has some humour to it, doesn't it? In, in, I suppose what we'd say around here, this is weird. This seems somewhat odd as we read through this narrative. What odd transport. A cart that has never been ridden and two cows that has never been yoked. Surely this won't get the ark to its destination. Surely not. You see, uh, let me read verse 9 again and watch. If it goes up the road to its own territory, to Beth Shemesh, then he has done us this great evil. What great evil? All that great evil to which Nathan spoke to us about last week. All that took place. All that took place in the cities that we read of in, in chapter 5. But if not, so if, if this, these two, two cows and this car that they've made, if it doesn't get them there, then we shall know that it is not his hand that struck us. It happened by chance. The Philistines here put the events of Dagon to the test. Who did this to us? Maybe there's arrogance, maybe there's sincerity. And then they make this ark and bring these two cows up. And if, if this new cart and two cows get to its destination, Beth Shemesh, by the way, this is not just over the road. This is apparently about seven miles away. Seven miles away. Just think logically for a minute. Use your mind here. Two milk cows and a cart are going to carry the ark back to Beth Shemesh, which is seven miles away. Which, what, what, I don't know, what, what's seven miles away from here? Sutton, Ashfield? Maybe. How far are you away from here, Nathan? But seven miles. It's going to go all the way to, to Nathan's. <laughs> Did this happen by chance, or was this the hand of God upon us? That's what's been asked, yeah? Yeah? Fair? What then happens? The story tells us, verse 10 through 14. <coughs> then the men did so. They took two milk cows and hitched them to the cart, and shut up their calves at home. Important information. They shut up their calves at home. 
And they set the ark of the Lord on the cart and the chest with the gold rats and the images of their tumors. And the cows headed straight for the road to Beth Shemesh. We should be amazed by that. And it went along the highway, lowing, mooing, as it went, and did not turn aside. This, friends, please hear this. With eyes, with eyes of, of uh, I'm going to refer to something that Nathan says, said last week in a minute, but open your eyes to this. Listen, lowering, lowering as it went, Cows headed straight for the road to Beth Shemesh and went along the highway, and it did not turn aside to the right hand or the left. And the Lord of the Philistines went after them to the border of Beth Shemesh. So they're following it. Where, what is happening? They're following this. They probably thought after 50 yards, that cow ain't going there. That's what they're thinking. Ain't going there. We're going to follow it. They had a walk on, didn't they? Now the people of Beth Shemesh were reaping their, their, their wheat harvest in the valley. Do you know what? I was almost tempted to bring in eschatology here. In the field, waiting. And then all of a sudden the sky opens and the Lord turns up. See, there's so much we could bring out of it, isn't there? But I won't do that. Maybe we should do that. Maybe we should do that. Maybe I'll do that. Because, friend, you know, one day, hear me, one day, I don't know when, and anybody who thinks that they know when, be aware of that person who thinks they know when. But one day, the sky shall split, and you shall be reaping in your field at Beth Shemesh. And you will see, you Christian, you shall see him. As he went, you, as he went, so he shall return. And you'll see him. It's not a myth, it's not a story. It's certain in our Hollywood film. One day God in Christ shall come and he shall gather. He shall be the one really doing his harvest on that day. He shall gather in every one of his elect from every corner of the earth. It's a great picture of that. They lifted their eyes and they saw the ark. Again, it deserves a sermon. Imagine it. It's been gone for seven months. And it's the grace of God what we see here. Don't get too lost. Don't get too bogged down here tonight with all the intricacies of these stories. See the gospel. They were in the fields and their eyes saw the ark and they rejoiced to see it. And the cart came into the field of Joshua of Beth Shemesh and stood there, a large stone was there. So they split the wood of the cart and offered the cows as a burnt offering to the Lord. Friends, all what we see here is marvellous. Like that of Elijah, God has showed himself God and pronounced the folly of every other God. The ark makes its way straight to Beth Shemesh. No deviation, no left, no right. All the way there, it went straight along the highway. These cows who were reared to milk their calves, friends, Imagine, they've put the calves, they've, they've took them away. These aren't traveling cows. Never thought I would be having a look of an into cows for a sermon. But these were not cows made to travel. Why didn't they pick an ox or a horse? In fact, why didn't they do it to which the scriptures tell us they're doing? The rods, the poles, why didn't they do it like that? Because... Friends, God, I believe, is showing us something. Even in this disrespectful Philistine paganism, God is speaking to us. These cows were reared to milk their calves. They were, they were given to eat grass. But yet this was the very vehicle that took the ark back into God's people. 
Imagine it. Stop for a minute and think about it. This is not normal. This is supernatural. Just like that. Fire on a sodden altar. I quote Nathan. What do you see? What do you see? Remember, I ask you that very same thing tonight that, asks, uh, that Nathan asked us last week. What, what is it that you see? I was taught to try and see Christ in every line. See, it's a, a little bit like the moment that the Lord calls Jeremiah. Remember what, he did, what did he say to Jeremiah? You know? First few verses of Jeremiah chapter 1. It's exactly what Prophet Nathan said. What do you see? What do you see? Remember? What do you see? Saints, we know that Jeremiah saw well. Do you see well tonight? Do you, as you open the pages of Scripture in your time for the Lord Himself, do you see well? Do you plead that the Spirit would, would open your mind up to the Scriptures? Friends, let me be honest with you. That's my prayer every day. That I would understand the Scriptures. That I might know them. That's why I was so blessed with the ministry this morning. So what do we see in this so somewhat odd story, at least for us as, as Gentiles, at least for us in Alfreton on the 10th of March 2024? What, what, what do we see? You might say, I have no idea. You might now be following me a little bit more. You might say, I'm not even sure what you're asking. What does this story mean to us? What does it mean to you tonight? At least the part to which I home in on. You see, if this was written for, for my instruction and that we might find comfort and hope, I ask you again, how can a story about a rat, a box, a tumour and a car and two milk cats, how can that bring me hope? Friends, I want to say one thing. Again, there could be many applications. But I want to say what we see here is the humility of God. The humility of God. We've seen it all the way through our story so far. God turns up to a little boy. Not a king. We go further back. Elkanah. A no one family. And I want to say to you again, I think there's every right to think that we see it again here. Think on it. Just think simply with me. What do we see? The ark of God arriving on the back of a wooden cart and two milk cows. Should not this ark had a, a glorious procession? In Exodus 25, we read some of the detail. We see, really, that the, that the poles were made so that the ark would be carried by priests. Important. Hoff, Hoffney and Phineas, they've, they've, they've trampled on this thing. There's no, there's no faithful priest to be seen. They should have been carrying it themselves. It should have never have been in the, the land of the Philistines in the first place. You see, as I said already, friends, the Philistines may have lacked reverence for the ark by putting on a cart and two, two milk cows, but surely we see more. What do we see? I think that we see a great picture of the great condescension of Christ. I think we see Christ being born of a virgin womb. I think we see Christ being born in Bethlehem and a dirty cave and a trough. 
I think that we see Christ riding in on a donkey. I think what we see here is the gospel of our salvation. I think what we see here is the humility of God because I see an old ruggish dirty cross that Christ would come and hang on and die. I think that's what we see. Entering into Beth Shemesh. You see, when I read of these milk cows carrying the ark, I read of the God who alone saves his people. What do I mean briefly? So often we think that we're the vehicle of all of this. If you like, we're his hands and his feet. I think in this story, God shows us, I don't think we are. Because he'll use two milk cows. And he'll use an ark. This is the, this, you know what this shows me? As this, these two cows ride onto Beth Shemesh. It says that, God, this is, that salvation is by God alone. By God alone. God providing himself and proving himself to be the God in the very face of his enemies. You see, this again was a display of the powers and the principalities being defeated. Again, I ask you just to, to use your mind, and Nathan touched that again this morning, that our minds be engaged. Two milk cows carrying an ark of God. It's foolishness. You know where I'm going, I'm sure. This is foolishness. It seems so, doesn't it? Do you, know when I, do you know when I think like that? When I consider this? I go straight to 1 Corinthians 1, 18 through 25. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, what is it, friends? It is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. I bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God. It pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For some, for Jews, request a sign, and to Greeks, seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ, crucified, to the Jews a stumbling block, and to the Greeks, foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. The weakness of God is stronger than men. Colossians chapter 2, having disarmed principalities and power. You think of those two cows walking up to Beth Shemesh. This is exactly what he is doing. He's disarming principalities and power. He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. Friends, as the transportation of God's ark into Beth Shemesh made a public spectacle of the Philistines and the so-called pagan god Dagon, this is what Christ came to do at the cross. Defeating sin, crushing Satan's head, and quenching the power of death. And now he is seated at the right hand of the Father in the heavenly places. You see what a comfort we have. What a comfort that you and I have. If you're in Christ tonight, you have a comfort. Why? Because the two milk cows has arrived. Christ has come. He has brought the victory. He has conquered. Do you know that he's conquered? Why live then as if you have everything to fear? Why live as if tomorrow is not sure? 
two cows in the milk cart have turned up? Why do we live as if as if there's no God at all? Why do we live as if pagan gods and all the rest of it and the nonsense out there has any power over us? Why do we fear? Why today in the church of Jesus Christ are we still riddled with fear? Because we did not realize that the cows have arrived. Friend, I want to finally finish with one thing. I was debating where to start, where to go. I thought, should we read? Should it, would it be easy, it'd be obvious to, to pick on these, well, I suppose I say it would be easy, it wouldn't be easy. But these men who looked on the ark, how are you looking on Christ? How are you tonight looking upon him? What have you done with him? What do you do with him? What shall you do with him? Again, I go back to what I spoke on in regards to presuming on the ark. Let us not be mistaken in this day that our church attendance, our membership to a church that's seeking to be faithful. But what have you done with Christ? What is your relationship with him? Matthew 7 says, On that day they will say, Lord, Lord. And they'll turn around and say, I never knew you. Those are the most frightening words in the whole of Scripture. I never knew you. But I prophesied. I never knew you. But, 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 but I understood um, Nathan's TTS. N I never knew you. But I gave in abundance. And I, and I, and I, and I, and I, and I did this. I'm asking you tonight, friends, simply as I finish, what is your relationship like with the Lord Jesus Christ? How are you looking at Him? If there's any of you tonight that has lost your first love, and you know, and you just know that Christ, and you've become cold to Him, that your preference and your, your daily life says actually something far more is important to me. My job's more important. My family, my, the, my this, my that, my job, my ministry, preaching. Don't just think that they have to be bad things. If there's ever a moment in my life that the preaching of the gospel is more important than the gospel itself, I have presumed on the ark. So I plead with you tonight to look upon this ark again, to look upon Christ. And if you are one of those tonight who say, Create in me a clean heart, O God, renew a right spirit within me, cast me not away. Christ has said, I'll come. And I'll bring comfort. If you are weary and heavy laden, do you want rest tonight? What about you who have never actually come? never bow the knee never confessed with your mouth that Jesus is Lord I want to say to you even with more urgency come come and be saved come and live the life of being a Christian do you rejoice like those in the field will you time is short as I visited Julie's family they said now they know that life is short don't presume on life don't fixate on that which is temporal but look to the glory of God which is found in Christ who came and died that you might have life may the God of heaven and earth by his spirit bless us Amen